Well, the last time I was here was a bit of a rush and I guess I didn't give myself enough time to sort of think about and ponder and meditate on the message that was so supposed to give. Um, but this time, um, righteousness is a very important topic to me personally, and I've had decades to think about it. Um, so before I touch on today's passage uh, of 1 John 3, chapter 3, verse 4 to 10, um, I'm probably going to touch a bit, sort of give um, sort of a, a short um, sort of a, uh, um, oh, sorry. Um, I feel I need to talk briefly about my own personal journey in finding righteousness um, because I think righteousness means different things to different people. I think for some, it's just a word to others. It's something that they could sort of lord over other people. Um, so just to start, um, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. Um, never had any experience like going to Sunday school. So, so the idea of righteousness is somewhat foreign to me, but I remember, I guess of all the things I remember as a child was that sitting in the back of my dad in my parents' car and asking my dad, what did righteous mean? Um, it was actually because there was a song playing and the, sort of the group that sang it was the Righteous Brother. And that's my first sort of concept. And that's the first, I mean, of all the things that someone remembers in their, sort of when they're sort of four or five, that's what I remembered. Um, and so it sort of stuck with me. And when I was in primary school, um, probably between sort of 11 and 12, I sat down with a piece of paper and a pen and I started writing down sort of the rules that I was going to set for myself. You know, don't lie, don't steal, don't do drugs, don't, you know, don't curse or swear. So I had this long list and I was sort of really focusing on trying to do those things and it was not something that you know my parents said this is what's right and what is what's wrong it's something that I've sort of, sort of put together and try and live by it um, of course um, it sort of made me feel that I'm sort of a bit better than other people so when I went to high school when I was I guess in equivalent so I was I grew up in Malaysia equivalent year nine to year 12, I was a prefect. So I'm not sure you have that here. And so it was like for me to keep all the other students in check, make sure they follow the rules. And that was a bit of who I am and people do see it. But I think there was one day, um, there was this kid. Um, I guess when I say kid, it was actually my, in the same year as I was, but it was in a different class. And he happened to form his own little gang of little tugs in school. And it was just after recess, the bell has rung and I'm trying to get all the kids back to class. And him with his gang was sort of trying to drag their feet, not going to class. And it sort of ended up um, at the water cooler and he was trying to get a drink just to try and it is time and I was trying to say no I just go to class and there was a bit of push a bit of shove and then he sort of fell back and which is quite dramatic which I thought that was a bit odd it's probably his experience playing soccer and then he got up and looked straight in my face and I'll see you outside after school and he walked off and I was like that escalated rather quickly and so I didn't tell anyone I was just sort of mulling over what am I supposed to do there? And sure enough, after school, as I was walking home, so back then I walked to and from school and he's seen me before, so he knows which path I take. So sure enough, he was waiting for me with his rest of his gang. I saw him, he saw me, so I can't just run away and it's not gonna end well for the rest of the school year. So I picked up the courage and I walked down 
and it was like oh my spider-man to his green goblin or my batman to his joker if you're a dc comic fan um and i faced him and i looked straight at him i reached out my hand and i apologized and he stood back a bit and he shook my hand and we walked um we parted ways so i guess you were thinking that was a rather anticlimactic story but i think for me that day um, I learned humility, I gained a little bit of wisdom, and I got home without a scratch. So, and I think after that, I still see him in school. Um, and it's sort of, we sort of give each other a little subtle nod. And I like to think that that was a sort of sign of a mutual respect. So I've heard, I don't give him any trouble, and I learned not to go beyond what is reasonable. And I think I've learned that righteousness is a personal thing. It's something you set for yourself and not something you demand of others because they might not have the, uh, the same idea of what's right and wrong. So I think it sort of shaped my personality of not trying to tell people they're wrong and sort of opposite to say nowadays, you know, activists, vegans that is telling people they should stop eating meat or they're murderers. I, you know, it's sort of opposite to my personality. Um, I guess a few years later, I was in Adelaide, my first year of university. And it was sort of the time that I first was first introduced to Christianity, to the gospel. And um, I started to learn about Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And it was something that sort of appealed to me. It's like, you know, if he was righteous, what can I do to be like him? And so, you know, a few months later, we're going to church and reading the Bible. Um, someone then pointed to me to um, Isaiah um, chapter 64, verse 6. Um, something that's often quoted, our righteousness are like filthy rags. And I think sometimes it's sort of quoted way too casually. But for me, that, that stood out, that passage stood out. And it was the, that moment in time that I realized that everything I had tried to do was nothing. And that with Jesus Christ, there is no way possible that I could turn this into this. And, and that's a big, big thing for me because righteousness was something that I hold on to quite strongly and realizing that what I have done, what I've made for the last decade was not, doesn't make me acceptable to God and I can't do anything to make it look like this. So a few months later, I've decided to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I think for most of us, we remember getting on our knees and said that sinner's prayer to repent of our sins. And um, I think for most people, they're probably thinking about maybe the sins they've committed, um, any sinful habits that they had and they promised to God they're gonna give it up, whether it's too much TV or drinking too much or swearing. I think for me, the most defining moment, the thing that I gave up most that day when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior was my righteousness. Because I know that by his promise, I have this in exchange for what I have given up. I think it wasn't long that at the end of the year, I went back to Malaysia and um, I guess some, my mom just said, do you want to go to this Christian camp? of kids. And since I didn't know anyone there, um, I thought, why not? I'll probably get to meet a few Christians. So I think my experience then is that I came across something that sort of troubled me. So something so I do observe as a young Christian. And um, I guess to cut the story short, I'll get back to it. But 
it has come to a point that I think from that experience, it actually troubles me now that when a Christian actually quote Isaiah 64 in certain contexts. And I know I've had said this to anyone and it's not meant to be for anyone. So here specifically, because I think for the last 20 years, whether it's in this church or my church, my other church, when I was in Adelaide, it's that I do cringe a little bit um, whenever someone prays publicly that and sort of declares, well, confess that their righteousness are like filthy rags. Because um, I think for me, with baptism in, in, Ro in Romans 6, uh, chapter 6, 2 to uh, verse 2 to 5, um, Paul describes our baptism as we were baptized into his death. And then when we came out of the water, we are raised a new creation in him. And that we are clothed in his righteousness. So when a Christian then says that their, their righteousness is like filthy rags, I had this image in my mind that in their walk with God, they have wandered back to their own grave and decided to... Uh, retrieve their righteousness and that was when back to the youth camp that I first went to that's what I observed there were some kids that they seemed to walk the walk and talk the talk in during the worship service during the sermons or bible studies but as soon as the free time is over and they can do what they want it's as if they take this aside fold it nicely and put this on because um, what we wear do influence how we behave. If you imagine if you're wearing a nice shirt and shoes and you're walking down the field and you see your friends playing, the so playing soccer, kicking a soccer or shooting some hoops, you probably think twice about joining them. But if you're wearing a t-shirt, shorts, an old pair of sneakers, you don't think twice. You just, if you've got the time, you probably just join them. And that's, that's what I fine and i don't know whether you've come across any christians who seem to be in that category where on sunday they put their sunday best on but then as soon as they go home they then change to something they find more comfortable and then they and that's what they do for the rest of the week and you know returning the next sunday they put this off put this back on and they pray forgive me lord for i've sinned um, wash me in your blood that might be wise now is that some sort of you know spiritual laundry day that on the sunday you wash this and then when you get home you change put this aside fold it nicely and put this back on and lift the rest of the day so you know so that's sort of my impression and So I'll get back to this. And then, so we'll come to today's passage. Um, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. And you know that he, you know that he was manifest to take away our sins. And in him, there is no sin. Whoever bites in him does not sin. Whoever sins, neither see him nor know him. Little children. Let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the work of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin, because he has been born of God. And this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, and whoever does not, uh, who, nor he, nor is he who does not love his brother. So I think in Philippians um, chapter three, verse nine, um, as Paul described, if man's righteousness is of the law, then I suppose lawlessness is the little holes that we in in their garment and sin is like the dirt if you're sort of rolling in the mud sin is the dirt that's on the cloth and if you've got holes it's on your body 
and you can't tell the difference. Um, sure, I think some Christians, we do trip and fall sometimes, but we get up again straight away. We turn to God, we brush off the dirt that we've got in us. But, those, but there are those who, having this on, they don't mind. They will be rolling in the dirt. And that's the difference. If we have this on all the time, as opposed to having a different, you know, wearing this for most of the time and only wearing this some of the time, then the decisions we make, the things that we do is different. So in this um, verses, in this passage, practice righteousness to me is not putting this on more often, but to put this on all the time, but to practice the sermon, to think twice before we do something. Is it right? Is it acceptable to God? And so I think if, if we see righteousness like a garment, then I think there's, we can see that the world's sort of idea of righteousness is like today's fashion. It seems to change very often. And more often than not, we see less and less materials, removing materials, and even now you can buy distressed jeans, like jeans that are purposely sort of worn down and you can buy them, which cost more than the actual clean pair of jeans. And that's the thing with, with sort of society now is that because they're used to that and it's slowly sort of being worn down. Um, if we say, look at fornication, it's an old term. It's no longer applies the sort of, Rip this bit out. What about abortion? Rip that bit out. What about assisted dying? Rip that bit out and it's just full of holes. And what about legalizing recreational drugs? Well, I see it as not so much as ripping bits off, but pulling on threads because as they start pulling, more bits actually fall out. If we met, if you think that if you're legalizing, that's not a problem. Imagine if politicians are making laws and changing laws while they're under the influence, or they are being influenced by whoever's giving them drugs to do certain things of changing laws. So that's now, and I think I'll go next. So I guess. I probably need to sort of cover this. I would like to go to um, sort of speak quickly about Matthew chapter 22, verse 1 to 14, the parable of the wedding feast. Or, well, similarly, this uh, Luke uh, chapter 14, the parable of the great supper. So you might think, what has it got to do with today's message? Well, I guess I could read the passage. Um, because I don't have the words now. Um, just to summarize it, a king had arranged um, a marriage for his son. But when the time came, the people who were invited decided they didn't want to come. And so the king had no choice but to send his servants out to invite, you know, um, to invite people in the highways, in the byways, the street and lanes in the city. And it was like everyone was invited, the good, the bad, the poor, the maim, the blind. Um, of course, it, it was not in, in Jesus' parable, it was not explicitly mentioned that the guests, the new guests were provided with something to wear at the wedding. Um, I've always, like, I've always thought that when I read the passage that they were supplied because if you think about it, you've got beggars, they won't have a pair, clean pair of clothes to wear. Or someone who's in the market, 
I don't know if any of you have gone to the market wearing your best clothes just in case some random stranger invites you to their wedding. So, and you've got travelers that's probably spent days traveling and they were all invited. They won't have time to go home and get change. And I guess I've read in some commentaries, it was in their custom that they were provided with something to wear. And at that wedding, the king found this guy who did not have the wedding garment on. And he sort of asked, why don't you have one? So he didn't dare to give an answer. So if you think about it, if he was a beggar, he could have just said, I did not have one. Or if he was a traveler, I live two days away. I will have to walk home. I will not make it, but I just wanted to come. But this guy, he didn't wear it because he thought that what he wore at that wedding was good enough. And us as Christian, we do not know when Jesus will, will come again. Will he find us wearing this or wearing this? Do we think that this is good enough that we can wear it during the day and only wear this on Sundays? So, I think in, in summary, it's fairly quick again. Um, I don't believe that it's a Christian's job to tell a non-Christian to put this on. Um, because they have no concept of it. And I think it would look bad if that non-Christian comes to us and say, I've met Christians that seems to wear this on Sundays. But then when they get home, they wear this for the rest of the week. They don't believe in God. They don't go to church. Why can't they wear this all the time? Of course, what's worse than that is that if that Christian they were talking about is us. But our task is to show Christ and his righteousness. And it's up to them to decide what they want to do with that. If they want to be acceptable to God, because what they have is not enough. Finally, can non-Christians tell that we wear his righteousness without us telling them that we do, but by them observing us living our life every day? It's not easy, but it takes a lot of practice. Thanks.